Hello from Shane Healy and today I am with Professor John Murta, one of Australia's most distinguished doctors. John, welcome to Melbourne Catholic. Thank you, Shane. We're talking to John for a couple of reasons. He is very well known worldwide for a number of his publications and a lot of his work, but he's also the guest speaker. Next Saturday night, September 8 at the Athenaeum Club in Melbourne. It's a big fundraiser for the Catholic Doctors Association, which is, if you like, regenerating. And it's $110 a ticket. And for that, you'll have a wonderful night at a wonderful venue, but you'll also get to hear the wise words of Professor John. And your talk is called to serve life as a doctor. That sounds fascinating. Tell us a little bit about what people who come along next Saturday night might hear, John. Well, I'll hear about my reasons for becoming a doctor. Yeah. And my uh, concept of serving. I think to serve as a doctor is a great privilege. And that's uh, been my uh, career. Um, I started uh, in the country and I always wanted to be a country doctor. Okay. Because I was very interested in serving a community. Yes. The discreet, discreet lot. And uh, so, Fortunately, I finished up in country practice where we had to care for about 3,000 people. When I say we, my wife and myself. And uh, uh, this was a terrific opportunity to serve. And uh, when I grew up in a uh, fairly staunch Irish Catholic environment, yeah. taught by the nuns, of course, uh, we were very committed to service. That was the whole principle. and. Uh, um, we were inculcated with the corporate works of mercy, and I'll just read them out. Yeah, sure. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead. Now, what better background to serve as a doctor? Oh, I totally agree. Where were you actually in the country? A place called Nearham South. Okay. Up in the mountains. Yes. Yeah, gorgeous part of the world. Lovely place. Yeah. And we had our own hospital and we were committed to serving those people. Um, and uh, that was a, a wonderful experience. I'm yeah. sure it was. And, and, and if I can just jump on a little bit, I'm assuming, and tell me if I'm wrong, that being a Catholic doctor these days probably has its challenges. There are so many vexed issues that you know Catholic doctors would be called upon to deal with. Are you going to run through some of those on the night and can you talk to us about some of those now briefly? Yes, well it is. I mean you go they're full of uh, altruism and you're going to serve people, you're going to always be available and have the Good Samaritan attitude that, yes. that everyone you come across, every sick person, every injured person needs, uh, they really need help. Mm. And it's our job to help them. So everyone has a right to medical care. So that's the principle behind it. And um, but I mean, you go in there full of idealism, but as you say, the realities are very confronting. <laughs> they are. And uh, I remember some doctor from a neighbouring town said to me, "It must be very hard being a Catholic doctor." And I said, "Well, it's not really, because you know your principles." and you stick to them and the and your community know and it sort of works quite well in most cases. Has it become more difficult say in the last five to ten years as I guess secularization has probably overtaken that traditional religious strength that existed in the public sphere? You're right it has because of the impact of Christianity whether it's Catholic or otherwise mm. has, has diminished and now we have the politicians having their say, bringing in laws, and uh, which make it very difficult. As you know, the laws on abortion and the ones that are proposed on euthanasia, they are putting the onus on the doctor to facilitate it. Can we talk through that a bit? I mean, how did you feel late last year when the voluntary assisted dying bill was passed here in Victoria? Well, I was very disturbed. I mean, we undertook measures to try and prevent it. And the college that I belong to and have been belonged to 50 years and a life member brought in, they supported physician assisted suicide, which devastated me. So I uh, had a lot to say about it mm. and finished up in the papers. Uh, 
and uh, I even threatened to resign because I could not believe that a reputable doctor's college could support it. So it does impact on us and, and we are obligated by law to facilitate not only euthanasia but abortion mm. and not only knows what's next. So we are very disturbed about what the politicians have done. We're talking to Professor John Murder. He, if you are like me and you're not heavily involved in the medical world, uh, all my doctor friends tell me I really am talking to one of the absolute gurus uh, today. And he's speaking next Saturday night, September 8, at the Athenaeum Club. It's a big night that the Catholic Doctors Association are putting together, and they're really hoping to get a very, very big crowd. So that's one of the reasons we'd really like to uh, thank you, John, for talking to us today, because it's another way of bringing a big crowd together next Saturday night. So we've talked about what you might talk about in broad terms, and a little bit about your background, but I'm told that your book, John Murta's General Practice, mm -hmm. is, if you like, a bit of a Bible around the world for practitioners and, practitioners and patients alike. Um, why do you think that's so? I think the reason is that the book is written differently. It's written from a patient's perspective, from a presenting symptom. Okay. Like if you come in with tiredness or headache, mm. it, they're the chapters as opposed to the old traditional way of doing it according to systems like kidney disease and sure. lung disease. When did you write the book? I wrote the book about, uh, it would be about 20 years ago. Okay, and it, and it still very much stands up in today's modern medical world. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Uh, f fortunately, it's, it's luck among other things, but it, it, it is uh, very popular around the world. Uh, when, the, when I was teaching the doctors from overseas who came here, they found it very hard to pass the exams and understand the culture. Right. So it was, the book was written simply, if I can put it that way, mm. easier to follow. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's done so well. So, Professor John Murta's general practice. That's the big one. That's the big one. And that's the one that people in countries all over the world will know and refer to. And that's right. Yeah, that's, that's a great honour on your part. Well, it is an honour, and as my son who gets around the world says, uh, this is serving, mm. because not only are you serving and educating doctors, but the, the patients, it flows through to that. We'll have a lot of people uh, today watching this video who aren't going to be going along to the Athenaeum Club. They'll just be interested in your career and what you've done and what you are continuing to do. I know you're doing some lecturing as well around the place. But what would you say to the average person who maybe has had a tough time medically, maybe is recovering from a nasty illness or a disease, or has had times in and out of hospital and maybe they get a bit morose or a bit depressed? Have you got a general comment to make to those sort of people in terms of what you've seen over the years? Well, they need to talk their problems through. They need to be very upfront and frank. So don't be insular about it. No, that's important to reach out. Okay. And they must have a general practitioner, of course, and if they haven't got a reliable one, get one. Okay. And, uh, but of course, there's the other things. You have to pray and you have to work at it, but you have to do, you have to meet the doctors halfway. Mm. I mean, we write patient education material and give them a slip and this is what you need to do but you have to do it. So they have to work at it, they have to work at exercises, they have to work at lifestyle, to work at diet. I mean, all those things are obviously fundamental. Uh, but they need hope. Mm. And, uh, and this business of uh, if you feel hopeless, there's a way out with physician assistants is absolute nonsense. It shouldn't be necessary. Well said. If, if people are uh, switched on, have a good doctor who they can relate to, and not only doctors, but paramedical people, nurses and all the people who called in. And this is what we did in the country. We got in touch with the service clubs. Uh, you know, uh, who, there's a lot of them. who are out there doing good works for the people who are struggling. Two more questions, Professor John. What would you say to Daniel Andrews and Jill Hennessy, who were really the architects of this legislation around euthanasia, who had reacted to something that had happened to them personally, that they'd seen a very close loved one die in quite difficult circumstances, great pain, and they therefore felt committed to this idea of, 
um, you know, the uh, euthanasia scenario. Uh, what do you say to people like that? And not just Daniel and Jill, but anyone who's experienced that, what must be a catastrophic situation to watch a loved one die like that. Well, it's a very good point, but of course, in the medical profession, we see it every day, mm. the, these tragedies. And the thing is, uh, uh, that bothers me. You've got to get over these things and look at the broad picture. To bring in laws because you have had a personal experience and a, and a vendetta for something is, is inappropriate. So I, I'm very concerned that they had used those experiences. I know I feel sorry for them. Of course. I know it influences them. But they should not sort of break, make a broad law on this basis. An interesting perspective. And my last question is, as you've lived this life of service, and as you've had a wonderful medical career, um, has your relationship with God grown, changed? Um, has it just always been there as part of your DNA? How would you describe that? Well, it's always been part of the DNA, but I think it's grown. It's given me a purpose for, for, for living and for service and for counselling people. And a lot of people uh, relate to that and they come to you specially because you have that background. That extra dimension, if you like. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it has its uh, handicaps and confrontation. And there are times when you feel upset about what the church's laws are, mm -hmm. be they on contraception or their attitudes to the lesbian and gay mm -hmm. community, which I think are out of date. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are conflicts and you have to learn that. But God is number one. I mean, Jesus is the great healer. He's the model. And you have other models. Uh, and uh, like Albert Schweitzer, who's a, a real hero of ours. Yes. And he's one of the great living, or has, was living physicians. So there's a whole lot of model, role models that you can follow. I mean, you're not alone. Well, I think uh, people going to the Athenaeum Club next Saturday night uh, are going to really enjoy uh, hearing what you've got to say, Professor John. It's been quite a privilege for me to meet you and uh, chat to you today, and I hope next Saturday night goes well, and, and good luck too with your continuing work, because I know even though you've officially retired, you're doing a lot of still great work around the place. So thank you. Thank you, Shane. Professor thank John Murter, and the tickets are $110 if you want to go next Saturday night to the Athenaeum Club.